Oh, hello, my beads. I uh, have a little warning of the trigger variety here for you. Even though this podcast is about the pursuit of good mental health, sometimes we'll be talking about not so good mental health things like depression, anxiety, and crying in public. Welcome to Sobcast the Podcast. I'm Christina Wolfgram, internet comedian and expert public crier. (laughs) I am currently recording this in a bed in New Mexico. I hesitate to call it my bed because it's just my temporary bed. Uh, If you've been following me, you know I actually live in Los Angeles, but... I've been taking refuge in New Mexico while, you know, the world is doing whatever the world's doing. And uh, yes, I did put a full face of makeup, including bright red lipstick on, just to get back in bed. You gotta do what you gotta do. I also have a fuzzy mic clipped to the front of my sweatshirt. Fashion statement, useful microphone. Before I get into this week's topic, I just wanted to thank everybody who listened to the very first episode and messaged me your poop stories and um, told me that you also like ASMR. I like can't believe anyone cares, so thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And yeah, holding my breath for some reason. Speaking of last week's episode, I shared a recent coping mechanism that I am very confused by, which is true crime ASMR. And then the past few days, I've actually noticed that my ASMR intake has increased by maybe 5,000%. Whereas I used to listen to it for like the 30 or so minutes before I fell asleep. Wait a second, sorry. That's a, that's a complete lie. I guess more like 30 minutes to two and a half hours that it takes me to get to sleep. But this week, I've been listening to it in the morning before breakfast. I've been listening to it while I do work. I've been listening to it uh, right after dinner, like a little ASMR dessert. I am really lucky that I'm nowhere near running out of videos. Thank you so much to all of the people who upload 45 minutes of video of them whispering. I watched a video today that was I think an hour and a half of one of my favorite ASM artists, ALB in Whisperland, paint characters from Animal Crossing. I've never played Animal Crossing. I've never really heard of Animal Crossing until today. So look, I'm learning new things. It's almost like these ASMR videos are keeping my baseline stress level manageable, which I'm very thankful for because Right now, my anxiety wants to be like one of those cartoon thermometers where it's like the temperature goes up really fast until it like explodes. You know what I'm talking about? Can you see that image? But the ASMR keeps me cool. I think it cools down my temperature, keeps me from spraying mercury everywhere, you know? We don't need any other health uh, dangers, especially not mercury everywhere. Definitely not cartoon mercury. This metaphor is getting out of control. This week, I wanted to explore sound a little bit more. Why does some sound make us feel good? Why does some sound make us feel like shit? (gasps) My cat just jumped up on the bed. Cancel everything. Episode two is canceled. My cat is here. Mister, come here. Oh, I love you. Yes. Come here. Easy come, easy go. In 2012, I moved from a relatively quiet neighborhood in Maryland to one of the loudest neighborhoods I've ever experienced in Los Angeles, California. Next door was a family who left all their windows open, 
and their kitchen was exactly parallel to my bathroom window. So basically all of their conversations were amplified through my bathroom into the rest of my apartment. And I learned a lot about them. Their uncle Chris made really good pancakes. Uh, They got a new dog. I think I must have been mistaken, but they might have named it Penis. Someone was talking about a penis. I don't know. You know, whatever. I'm pretty sure one time I heard Uncle Chris giving someone else a tattoo. So that was cool. There were lots of dogs. There were two ice cream trucks. One played normal music like do 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 do. And the other one might have been haunted because it played like off tune kind of ghostly versions of like ring around the rosy and drove really slowly around the neighborhood like a like a specter in the night. Sometimes it would actually just play Christmas music. I mean not normal Christmas music, haunted Christmas music. <laughs> And the Pace de Resistance, across the street, I had a neighbor who just about every hour walked out onto his stoop and hawked a loogie, like without fail. I didn't need clocks anymore. I would just listen for the sound of his spit and I would know an hour had passed. Some nights, one of the neighbors had a live mariachi band. (laughs) And the only reason I know for sure it was a live mariachi band is because I saw them walking down the street in their full outfits and they were playing their guitars as they walked to the party or the the solo performance with which just my neighbor watched. I'm not sure. There was also a daycare on one corner. It was just, it was a very lively neighborhood. When I first moved there, I had a lot of trouble getting to sleep. I felt like The sounds constantly kept me on edge when I would hear that creaking, kind of terrifying sound of the approaching ghost ice cream truck. I would feel the need to like lock all my doors and hunker down, maybe call my mom, tell her where I am. But I lived there for five years. And when I moved to a quieter part of town, I actually missed the noise. (laughs) Over those five years, those crazy sounds kind of became the soundtrack of my good memories, which is not the soundtrack I would pick. Like, I'd kind of like the soundtrack from Little Miss Sunshine to be my the soundtrack of my life, but, um, you know, you can't be picky. When I moved into my new place, it was actually too quiet. And I ended up back in the same mental space that I did when I first moved into the noisy neighborhood. I was like, doesn't anyone have a barking dog around here? I can hear my own thoughts echoing. I don't even know what time it is. No one's hawked a loogie in ages. So why do sounds have such an effect on our mental well-being? Well, it seems like the answer is we kind of don't fully know. Lots of studies have been done that show sounds definitely lower stress and anxiety, but it's just not really clear how that happens. It's just kind of like, well, we're glad to know. Something I really like in ASMR is when artists add binaural sounds to their recordings. And I never actually knew what that was until this week. I just, I guess, took it for granted. (laughs) But binaural sound is when two similar, but just a little bit different tones are played in each ear. Your brain has this reaction of like, oh, okay. Let's calm it down. Let's, Let's slow it. Let's slow our roll. It's time to take a breath. A study done in 2005 in Spain showed that music with binaural tones lowered anxiety for patients right before surgery. I don't know about you, but if I was about to go into surgery, I'd be pretty freaking nervous. So if music with binaural sounds can lower anxiety in that stressful of a situation, it could probably help you out 
if you're just laying in your bed trying to take a little nap. Although I don't know your life. Studies have shown that our brains really like familiar sounds. That's why the sound of rain, the sound of water, or maybe the ocean, for me, someone reading a story might be very calming and soothing. However, maybe like the few times I've listened to whale sounds, that's been a little disturbing for me because my body might be like, "Mm, should we be worried about this? Remember Free Willy? That movie made you cry a lot. Like, so we really have to listen to whale sounds right now. Can we go back to the whispering about murder? Okay, thanks. If you're one of those people who's like, but I hate ASMR, the sound of someone whispering sounds like nails on a chalkboard and makes me want to vomit and throw my phone out the window and also take a vow of silence for the rest of my life. Do not fear. Every body is different. Every brain is different. Sounds probably affect everybody in different ways. You might just have to find your perfect sound. Maybe your perfect sound is the sound of silence. Am I right? Even though there's no definitive answer as to why certain sounds, especially nature sounds, can decrease our blood pressure, get our anxiety lowered, help us breathe a little better. There is a theory. Remember last week when I was talking about how the fight or flight chemical reaction in our brains can actually make us not poop, specifically me, not poop? Well, it turns out that some sounds have the opposite effect to fight or flight. This state of being in our brain is called the rest digest response. So we have fight or flight, which is when your body's like, holy shit, we have to run from this metaphorical tiger. And then we have the rest digest response where it's like, okay, that bean and cheese burrito that you stress ate, now we can finally just let it flow. (laughs) Why don't you take a little nap? Why don't you take a little sleep and nappy, huh? You deserve it. You were going through so much. Why don't we just do a little rest digest and take a little poopy? <laughs> I'm not a scientist, okay? But this that's really interesting. That actually kind of affirms my love of ASMR a little bit. To make you feel less alone, I wanted to share another story about a time I had a very bad sound experience. About two years ago, I was in a pretty weird mental place. I had just been diagnosed with depression. I wasn't on medication yet. I was seeing a great therapist, but I was in a pretty constant state of almost sad. I was just like skittering along the surface of sadness all the time. And that also made my anxiety go up because I was like, any second I'm going to fall into the sad, I'm not going to be able to get out. And this is the end and I can't control it. And what am I going to do? I don't know. Maybe I'll just sit in the bathroom at work and cry. Which, you know, works sometimes. In that time period, I tried so many different coping mechanisms. And one of them was a sound bath. If you've never heard of a sound bath, it's not like a bubble bath. The best way I can describe it is that it's a group meditation that instead of being guided by a person is actually guided by sound. There are lots of different instruments used, but the most prevalent one are singing bowls. Not like, ah, singing bowls. I looked up a little bit about the history of singing bowls. Tibetan singing bowls are made out of metal, glass, or crystal. Each resonates in a different note. They've been being used for over 2,000 years. There is proof that Tibetan monks were using them as long ago as 500 BC. It was like ASMR for monks. Different notes produce different frequencies, which reach different parts of your body, which are thought to clear different chakras. I'm not going to get into chakras because I don't know anything about that. (laughs) I read about a few examples. For instance, a C note is associated with your lower chakra, lower in your body. 
So that's commonly used for grounding meditations. The F note is associated with the heart and can be used for heart opening meditations, which sounds so lovely. It all sounded so lovely. Like, doesn't that sound so great? Like someone's going to play this like mystical ancient instrument and you're just gonna lay on the floor and let the waves wash over you like a beautiful bubble bath and you'll just emerge like a phoenix out of the bath, a new bird and you feel great. Yeah, I just had really high expectations. So when my boyfriend was like, hey, I found this sound bath we can go to, I was like, hip hip hooray, I would love that. I paid $35 to get in. I got some free tea right before, so that's cool. The sound bath was at a meditation center in Los Angeles. It smelled really good. They had lots of pillows, it was a big space. It felt very safe. The sound bath started at 6 p.m. and it was supposed to end at 7.15. My Taurus brain was like, perfect. Then we'll go out to dinner and we'll eat dinner by 7.30. Magical. Could not be more perfect. We go in, we go in the beautiful room, we grab our beautiful pillows, and me, being an over-enthusiastic, eager beaver, ready to rid myself of all depression in one meditation, goes right up to the front, right next to the stage where all of the singing bowls are, I plop down, I'm like the closest to the wall, the farthest to the door. Maybe about 40 people come in after me and fill up the entire room. Which, you know, I think would be kind of lovely. Sharing an experience with a community of people like that, I mean, that, that can be really nice. The woman who was leading the sound bath was exactly who I thought would be leading a sound bath in Los Angeles at 6 p.m. on a Sunday night. She had hair down to her butt. She was wearing all these loose clothes and she wasn't really walking as much as she was like floating around. She kind of never let her arms be by her sides. They were always kind of like wafting through the air. Like there was something she could see that we couldn't. I was like, okay, yeah, that's really cool. I'll put my brain in the hands of this like Professor Tarani lookalike. That's perfect. She started out by giving a little pep talk. She was like, hi, I recognize a lot of faces here. And if you're new, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. She said we could lay down or sit down or even stand up if we wanted. We should just listen to our bodies, let the sounds flow through us and enjoy. And she also just quickly mentioned right at the end, oh, and if you've been here before, you know I like to go a little overtime. Yes, okay. Three hours later, it's 9 p.m. My bladder is full of free tea. I am sobbing as a man with a didgeridoo walks by me for the umpteenth time, just billowing this sound into my face. I keep looking around and in the dim light, I see people sleeping. I see so many people smiling to themselves. No one has gone up to go to the bathroom. So I don't feel comfortable trying to step over everybody trying to leave. The sounds had an opposite effect on me than what was supposed to happen. It might have been the frequencies. It might have been that maybe I brought some of my negative energy into the experience. But all I know is that I was on like the verge of a panic attack for probably the last two and a half hours. <laughs> I think it was made worse by the fact that there were a lot of people around me and that I felt trapped and that I couldn't leave. I think I felt really down on myself because I thought there was something wrong with me that I couldn't enjoy the singing bowls and the didgeridoo. Oh, I, you know what? I just remembered something too. There was a whole section right near the end where 
the teacher would walk around and put a singing bowl on your chest and play it. And I had tears streaming down my face. I was hiccuping. She approached me and I said, yeah, it's okay to put it on my chest. And she did the bowl and I didn't really feel anything. And we, we lock eyes and it almost was like she just shook her head like, never mind, I can't deal with this and walked away. I'm sure that's just my perception. She seemed so cool, so there's no way she would have like abandoned me if she knew that I was having a hard time, but oh, the memory is very vivid for me. <laughs> I'm sure the fact that I was starving didn't help either. So for the past two years, I've just thought, oh, okay, sound baths are not for me. But I think what it comes down to is sound really affects me. I scoured the internet looking for answers. I googled, why does sound bath make me feel bad? Sound bath sad? Question mark. Crying in a sound bath. And I couldn't really find a lot of answers. So much of the internet is pro sound bath. A lot of descriptions of what people experienced during sound baths felt very general to me, which I completely understand. It's a really personal experience. So I'm sure you'd rather say like, yeah, I felt way more relaxed than saying like, yeah, I worked through a childhood trauma or something like that. However, I finally found some answers at a website called soundhealingforum.discussion.community. In a 2015 post, someone who runs sound baths asked fellow sound bath runners whether they ever had people experience negative emotions during sound bath and end up crying, <clears throat> like me. A fellow healer sound bath enthusiast named Linda with a Y said that some will have an incredibly beautiful experience. They might see colors, have astral traveling, see spiritual guides, but some people might run into emotional blocks and that's why they will have negative emotions and they can be pretty powerful. And the large groups can contribute. I felt very understood by Linda with a Y. She didn't have exact reasons for why these things happened, but knowing that it happened to other people made me feel just a little more normal, which is always, you know, a little treat. As much as I wish I had a one-way ticket to some astral traveling, I don't know. I wonder if now, after two more years of therapy and mindfulness, if a sound bath would make me feel different. And all this thinking about sound led me down one last rabbit hole. Around the same time two years ago, I was seeing a therapist that would do EMDR therapy with me. In case you've never heard of EMDR therapy, it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Great. Let me translate that for you. As I understood it, EMDR therapy was a kind of physical way to get into your brain and track down the little spaces in your brain where you hold trauma and eventually reframe the trauma so that you can process it and let it go, let it go, just let all that trauma go. Yep, it's episode two and I'm singing Frozen. Oh Lord. EMDR is actually used a lot for people who are suffering from PTSD. I won't get into details about what I was talking to my therapist about. <laughs> no, you gotta pay extra for that. But I will tell you what my experience was like. During almost every treatment, I held these two little paddles that would vibrate from right to left, right, left. And after a while, while we were talking, I would kind of barely notice it anymore. Other times, I would also wear headphones and there would be bilateral sounds. Different than binaural. Bilateral sounds are more steady and rhythmic, and they are the exact same note again and again. It's a little hypnotizing, to me anyway, 
Um, the most intense days, we also added in a visual element. I say we as if I was a professional in part of this uh, treatment. I was not. Um, my therapist added in a visual uh, component to the treatment where I would watch a light travel back and forth on a board. I would keep my head still, but my eyes would move back and forth, almost like, again, like a hypnotist holding one of those pocket watches in front of your face. While all this was happening, we would talk about how I felt, we would talk about the past, we would talk about all, all sorts of things. She would guide me through it. I felt very safe with her. And also thinking back on it, her voice was a big part of the experience as well. I saw somewhere online someone describe it as a controlled flashback, which I really liked. I think that's a very accurate way of describing EMDR therapy. Even though I was just sitting with headphones on my head and these little plastic things in my hands, I would leave completely exhausted. I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was that I needed a nap. My therapist told me that was my brain processing things. Sounds good to me. We actually ended up moving my therapy sessions to Saturday morning so that I could go home, eat lunch, and take a nap, which, I don't know, is kind of a perfect Saturday, <laughs> in my opinion. Anyone else? <laughs> Doing my own Google amateur research on EMDR, I couldn't really find any explanation of how it works, but I can't help make the connection between the sounds that call me with maybe the sounds that heal me and also the sounds that disturb me, but we don't need to get into that again. <laughs> I guess my conclusion is sounds are powerful. So if you find what works for you, definitely stick with it. If it's rainforest noises, if it's dolphins, maybe white noise is your thing. If you want to record tapes of yourself just saying, you're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. And that soothes you. <laughs> I think you can take it seriously. It is a real form of healing and therapy. And in conclusion, I say, I like the sound of it. <laughs> no, no, please don't turn this off. I won't make any more jokes like that, I promise. Okay, before we move on to the next part of the podcast, I am so excited for a word from my very first sponsor. Hello. Did you know that literally anybody can make a podcast? I mean, look at me. I'm making a podcast in my bed. How am I doing it? Anchor. Anchor is the best, easiest way to make podcasts. It's free. They have recording tools. They have music. They even have ways to edit your podcast on your computer or even your phone. Want to make a podcast and you're like, but I don't know how to put it into the internet machine. Well, that's okay. You don't have to worry about it because Anchor will distribute your podcast for you and put it on all the major streaming networks like, I don't know, Spotify or, or iTunes. Have you heard of it? Yeah, Anchor can do that. They have the power. Also, Anchor will help you make money from your podcast. Doesn't matter how many listeners you have, they'll help you get sponsorships. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Wow, what an ad. Oh, welcome back. Oh, I'm so cozy. I'm still in this bed. The sun has set. It's almost dinner time. And it's also time for How Am I Coping? I really need to come up with a theme song, huh? <laughs> okay, how am I coping this week? It's so nice of you to ask. That is so generous. This week, I've been coping by drawing. I have been drawing so much. I've been drawing 
pretty much only my cat, Mr. Space, just again and again and again. It kind of reminds me of when I used to draw girl bands in the back of my third grade math quad book. And I would just draw like my own version of the Spice Girls again and again and again until I was kind of failing the class and my dad picked up my notebook to see how my work was going and saw that it, my notebook was just filled with pictures of girl bands. Also, fun fact, um, I didn't like how I drew faces, so I would draw the girl bands um, with no faces. It was just their bodies. <laughs> Anyway, that's beside the point. This week, drawing has been incredibly therapeutic. Um, I've been lucky enough to be borrowing an iPad Pro, and I've just been using that Procreate app. Oh boy, is it fun. Um, it just makes me a better drawer, a better artist, because I can trace my cat's face. So I put pictures of Mr. in the app and then I just trace them and then I color them however I want. And then I make his face a little madder or a little cuter or whatever. And so I just sit with my cat on my lap while I draw my cat on an iPad. I've been seeing so many memes or I don't know, advice on the interweb that's like, now's the time to be creative. Get that script out. Get that novel out. Make sure you're using the best of this time. And that started really affecting me. Writing is my main form of self-expression. It's how I communicate with myself. But lately, it's been too much. I sit down to write, and it feels like I have to tell the story of what's going on right now. And since the story isn't over, I have no idea what to say. So instead, I draw Mr.'s face again and again and again. And I can do it for hours. I can really get lost in it. It's like reading a really good book. So if you're looking for a relaxing activity or a way to just zone out, please don't feel like you have to do your life's work right now. If you need permission, I'm giving you permission to just lounge and if you'd like to trace my cat's face, there are plenty of pictures of him on my Instagram. Feel free. I would be delighted. He would be delighted. He's so beautiful and he knows it. And really, I think one of his goals in life is to be immortalized in as many art pieces as possible. So feel free. Tag me in him. It's the sea wolf. I'd love to see it. <gasps> I just had the best idea. Maybe after social distancing is over, we can open an art gallery where it's just all of our drawings of Mr. It can be an immersive experience. And then at the end, you can try to pet him. <laughs> that would be really fun. Okay, cool. Now, now I've turned this into a big project, like I do with literally everything I enjoy. No, that's fine. It's not stressful at all. No, but seriously, does anyone want to do that with me? The Mr. Gallery? Are you kidding me? Cat art? A gift to the world, honestly. Okay, if my brain's coming up with new business ventures involving my cat, I think that means we've reached the end of this episode. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I am honored that I got to play your little eardrums for a while. I don't even have the words to express how much I hope you're doing okay. Is it too soon to tell you I love you? Oh well. Love you. Bye! Sobcast the Podcast was created and hosted by Christina Wolfgram. Editing by Jordan McKittrick. Producing Stephanie Kent. Special thanks to Brittany Sandler, Missy Modell, and obviously my mom and dad, who let me cry whenever I was having big feelings. <laughs> <laughs>